the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And now shall we hear the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instruct the hearts of your faithful, be by the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit. We may be truly wise, never rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Father Lynn Terry, pray for us. St. Ignatius, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So you're welcome. We welcome you to our Ignatian Forum with Mary Martirana, Eric File, and myself, Father Ed Broom. And we're going through the um, different intentions and the novena of divine mercy. And yesterday we were um, expounding upon the fact that there are many people who have drifted away from the church, and one of the reasons why is because of ignorance. No? Ignorance and just a lack of catechesis. And um, Mary was quoting the, uh, the example of the bishops in the 90s that really felt that there was a really weak catechesis um, um, over the past couple of generations. And I was thinking about that just a few minutes ago, that uh, how many, um, I don't know the statistics exactly, but there have been some studies where something like 70% of the Catholics don't really understand what the real presence is. In other words, if you ask them, what is, uh, what is the Eucharist? Uh, some people will say, well, it's a bread, it's a symbol of Christ, and, or I don't know what it is. And if you have a, um, an identity crisis with respect to the Eucharist, I think that's pretty serious. Yeah. It's pretty serious. So that was our conversation we had mm -hmm. yesterday. And um, I'd like to just finish that, then we'll move on to another number. So well, we can talk a little bit about that and then okay. move on to um, another topic within the Divine Mercy and Novena Intentions. Um, Good catechesis should be built upon four different pillars. So the catechism of the Catholic Church, or any good catechism, has got four pillars. And they are the dogmatic part, the moral part, the sacramental part, and then you have the part on prayer. So for it to be a, an integral, well um, well-expressed, well-understood, catechetical formation, you have to have those four pillars. No? Dogmatic means we have to know the creed. Uh, moral, we have to know the Ten Commandments. Sacraments, we have to understand the sacraments uh, and what are the effects and how to prepare for the sacraments. And the last part is on prayer. Uh, the Catechism does a really good job on, on what prayer is. Um, Mary, here's a question for you. Catechism, that comment you made about the bishops kind of struck me, that the bishops were really aware of um, a real ignorance in catechesis. Um, what can we do to remedy it? Now we used the 90s. So probably it was the early 90s, at least uh, 25, 26 years has passed, uh, maybe even close to 30. And maybe it hasn't gotten better, you know. Maybe it's actually devolving into even more confusion. We've never lived in a world with so much information, but never lived in a world that has so much confusion. Is there any remedy, Mary? That question makes me sad. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that. I was, I was thinking that. Because I know, I hear so often people come to the exercises from parishes all over Southern California. Praise God. They hear about it. Someone invites them. They come. And their, their lives are changed. We see that. But they, the things they say are, we've never heard, we don't hear it talked about in our parish about sin, 
about the consequences of sin, about the importance of going to confession, frequent confession, about the truth of the Eucharist. So that makes me sad. And so I'm, I'm wondering, um, but on the other hand, then I do hear of many good priests that are preaching and teaching on these topics. But I would say the scale weighs on those who tell me they don't hear it, as opposed to the, those who tell me they do hear these topics. And that makes me sad. Mm -hmm. um, the elect, on the um, side of the modern media, there's an explosion of material available for people that want to learn about their faith, want to learn about devotion, want to learn about prayer. So there's so much available today. It's so beautiful. But because then I hear what I just told you, then I'm wondering how many are actually taking advantage of what's there. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have an answer. Sure. There was once a um, conversation between two Protestant pastors, and one was a um, Protestant pastor from Africa, and he asked the uh, American Protestant pastor what he believed to be one of the most um, noxious or pernicious dangers for the spread of Christianity. And the um, African pastor said there are just too many distractions in the United States. Not to say that these distractions are um, necessarily sinful, but um, the spiritual exercise, we focus a lot upon principle and foundation. And I never, I never get re tired of repeating principle and foundation while we're here, where we're heading, how to get there. Um, there's a pope that said if the, if the whole world knew what principle and foundation was and put into practice, the whole world would be saved. Um, you know? Eric, what do you think? Is there... Is there some remedy for this catechetical confusion or drought that maybe we've been going through? Is there some type of remedy? As Mary said, it is. A, I think it's a very difficult question, but um, I think there are things that, that we can do uh, to help the situation in terms of, um, you know, remedying the, the you, know, you know, statewide, I mean, di di diocesan-wide, statewide, uh, nationwide, uh, worldwide, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of that can be th like boiling the ocean, but um, God knows that, and he knows that each of us can do, I think, what the best that we can do to help promote good catechesis, and so especially, I think, Mary, for you and I, and of course, Father Ed, for those of us that are involved in programs where we do uh, faith formation of some at some level, uh, we can do the best that we can and we can pull the things from the things that we teach things that are orthodox and standard and especially from the catechism from sacred scripture and from the catechism and and to keep learning our faith um you know i feel like if i could do more in terms of learning my faith one of the like one of the things that you talked about the cornucopia of available resources that can sometimes be a problem it's like <laughs> am i going to like read a book am i going to you know, there's a lot of, like, um, you can get online courses. Father, you've introduced me to some courses where, you know, you can listen. There are, there's so many, like, audio courses that are available and uh, a lot of things that are free on, uh, on YouTube. You also have to be um, discerning about that. Uh, but for my part, um, you know, one of the things that I do in the spiritual exercises when I teach is I try to use a lot of references uh, for cred credible sources because I'm not a priest. Um, I don't have a degree in theology. I have a lot of years of formation experience here. Um, but uh, I will uh, literally uh, sometimes in key areas of teaching actually quote from the Bible or the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And one of the things that always kind of throws me for a loop is some things that seem so basic to us now 
Mary, is the reaction that you said. <laughs> Why haven't we heard this before? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's also incumbent because, you know, when people come into a good program that's orthodox, it resonates. I believe there's a supernatural uh, identification that, you know, this rings with the truth because I experienced that myself. Mm -hmm. I go, this makes sense. This mm -hmm. is true. And especially if whoever is teaching or however it's being imparted to me, if I see what the sources and the sources are things that are really not refutable, the Bible and the Catechism of the Catholic Church are the like primary saints, uh, a lot of things that, but just in terms of, I think one of the things I, I said before, uh, yesterday or the day before, it's, it's incumbent upon individuals, especially adults and, and teenagers, I think from teenage up, for us to take the responsibility to catechize ourselves well and to know the difference and to be able to discern. Uh, and so uh, I think that's important. So I think at an individual level, I think it has to start there. I think, you know, I think sanct trying to sanctify the world and trying to teach people about the truths of our faith, I think it all starts with us and it starts with prayer and it, um, staying close to the Holy Spirit and the sacraments, just kind of the basics. Yeah. You mentioned this yesterday, and I had this inspiration about a year ago during the summer to give a course in theology, and I always long to do something like that because having studied theology for many years, many years ago rather, it, it was always kind of a feeling, why not um, give these people a course in theology? And um, we did it for, uh, it, was, it was done for about, uh, I guess a few weeks. And uh, I was able to go through, just the vocabulary I found it to be very enlightening that people really like to hear those words. Yeah. And um, for example, going through uh, Christology and Ecclesiology and Eschatology, Christian Anthropology, Soteriology, um, Pneumatology, uh, and then just going, get defining those words, I found that the people were fascinated. And then giving them just a, uh, because I reckon it was just going to be like a flash course. What can you do in, what can you do in, um, it, it was about four or five weeks, and I gave two sessions during those Sunday periods. But um, I felt um, afterward that I was able to at least convey an understanding of the structure of the Catechism of the Catholic Church and then Vatican II. Especially the Vatican II documents I went through, De Verbum, Sacrosanctum Concilium, uh, Gaudium et Spes, and Lumen Gentium. The fact that those people were able to understand maybe some of the essential features of the dogmatic constitutions of Vatican II, that was already placing a foundation, and then it's just a matter of, as you said, Eric, um, as adults, it's incumbent upon us to be um, mature enough to work on our own formation. Uh, in the spiritual exercise, yes, I gave like, uh, I gave a talk on some of the basic elements on prayer, and one thing I said was, Teresa of Avila um, reformed the uh, women's branch of the Carmelites in the in the in the the fifteen uh, hundreds. She would not allow a woman to come into the convent who couldn't read. Now back then, it was an agrarian society where most of the people in Europe could not read. Now. Why was it that she wanted a woman could read? She believed in being in autodidactic. Autodidactic is a technical word which means you can educate yourself. However, you have to have good sources because you read a 
read a, a book that's just besmirched with theological erroneous concepts, you end up by um, ending up confused at best, or maybe losing your faith, the, the worst scenario. Yeah. So, um, uh, at least when I went to college, I'm a little bit younger than both of you, is, is uh, the teacher would give you a summary of the concept and it was incumbent upon you to spend you know, hours reading, investigating that text before you finally have your exams. So I think as adults we have to know, so I think it's good to have spiritual direction and part of the oblate charism is, is knowing good um, texts to, to read for your ongoing formation. What, what both of you said, the, the problem is there's so much literature out there and um, in our formation, what should you study? I think in the modern world, the Catechism of the Catholic Church and the documents of Vatican II, if you can, um, you can say that you understand the basics of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And you can say that you know how to handle the documents of Vatican II. If you have a, a handle in those two areas, I think that you've got a, a foundation on which you can build. Then, there is a charism within a charism. Charism, what does that mean? That's a specific physiognomy that the Holy Spirit has transmitted to an individual to found a congregation or an order. Specific physiognomy or, or face that differentiates that founder from another one. Now, this forum is, uh, it's not a Carmelite forum, even though we do refer to Teresa of Avila. It's not a Trappist forum. It's not an Augustinian forum. It's not um, a Camaldolese forum, okay? Uh, in other words, these are all strains of spirituality, but we, every time we come together to talk, we're, we, we, we try to bring something of, uh, of Ignatian spirituality into this topic, as well as something that's related to the Blessed Mother. We cannot, being an oblate of the Virgin Mary, I don't think we're ever going to forget to mention Mary in one way or another in our conversation. But um, I mentioned both of you at the end of the conversation yesterday. In Ignatian spirituality, uh, we've talked, uh, we've talked about, uh, we spent the first, I say, about a week going through principle and foundation. And we decided to talk about God's mercy. But there's, there's so much more in Ignatian spirituality that you can talk about. I mentioned we could talk about the rules for discernment. You could talk about the second rule for discernment. You talk about the rules for thinking with the church. You could talk about the rules for scrupulosity. You could talk about the rules for eating. You could talk about uh, there's other Ignatius at the end. He also gives other 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 types ways of prayer. He gives other. So um, then I mentioned we could study Ignatius Jesuit saints. And you can study some of the writings of experts like Father Tim Gallagher, or you can go back to the, you know, the 1600s. You had some of the Spanish writers on Ignatian spirituality are just fabulous. And Father Tim said a lot of these treasures, like La Palma, have never really been translated yet. Even we we, we talk about the letters of Saint Ignatius. We could, we could actually take a, cup, a letter or two and spend a whole hour just reading and discussing that. Say, for example, we took the letter of uh, St. Francis Xavier to uh, St. Ignatius on December 3rd. Uh, we could spend a, a long... Maybe we'll do that. Mm -hmm. But um, our purpose is, I think, the, the three of us want to grow deeper in Ignatian spirituality. I honestly admit that I've got to go deeper. I think both of you would probably... It meant that you're not the paragon of ex excellence in Ignatian spirituality. I think any of you are 
walking Ignatian dictionaries in which we can maybe stop you and open up the page and you have a, oh. <laughs> an eloquent <laughs> discourse and, and the, 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 the Spanish of Ignatius on, <laughs> on the word discern today. And, 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 and I, we, we, we're all learners, aren't we? Mary, maybe I'm talking a mile a minute. Do you have any comment on, <laughs> comment on what, we, what we're saying? On, um, on growing in nation spirituality? Or do you think we've, we've all mastered it? <laughs> You're making Eric and I just laugh. I mean, all we can do is laugh. I'm not going to claim that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even near that one. <laughs> um, it, just the richness of it. Everything you said, they're just expounding on the richness of Ignatian spirituality is so beautiful. And uh, so it's... What do you like best about Ignatian spirituality? If someone um, in the class, because you're teaching a class or facilitating, say, uh, Mary Martyron, you've been with the exercise for quite a few years, so what's your forte? What really, what do you love best? I, I have to love principle and foundation oh. best because that orients my whole life. Without that, I'm just, it's a series of topics that are interesting, but I wouldn't know how to integrate them. Mm -hmm. That's all. Eric, um, I think I know your favorite topic. I'm going to be starting it tomorrow in my exercises. I think you just love the four last things, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am getting older every year. I, and uh, we were just talking about that the other day. <laughs> Do, do, about the, the food I'm going to be four, eating. Four last things on. Maybe our, our, uh, our family here does Yes, <laughs> uh, that would be death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And, and isn't that one of your favorites, though, Eric? It, it, well, it is because uh, it, it, it getting close to it tour, hurts. Right? <laughs> it, it hurts, but it you know it's I know that it's good for me to contemplate that really every day, and you know asking myself, am I ready? Uh, but uh, that isn't probably what I would have said. You know, Eric, just a side note, is I taught my, my, my pray for her. My aunt died a couple of days ago, and my mom's oldest sister, so you might pray for Dolores Trainer. Um, she was my, my mom's only sister, and she died at 93. But um, about that topic, and I thought we're gonna, we'll, we'll address the topic of the last thing sooner or later. You know, we're not going to get off the hook, are we? No. But you know, um, when my dad died, three of the relatives died three days back to back. The day after my dad died, his sister died. And so the brooms, uh, on my dad's age, his, his siblings died within 48 hours. The others, I mean, my dad was one of five. And then the day after that, my mom's older brother died. So within, within three days, three of my relatives passed away. So I think about that today. I thought I'd bring that into our topic that we really don't, um, we don't know when God's going to call us. It's like a domino effect, you know? One broom fell, another broom <laughs> fell, and another broom <laughs> relative fell. And it's like a domino, the, <laughs> the triad. <laughs> but the key is we've got to be prepared. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, we need to be prepared, especially in times like we're in right now. I mean, when has there ever been a worldwide pandemic to the magnitude that we're seeing right now? Um, I mean, I don't study the statistics or anything, but the way that this has affected the entire world. I mean, in the past, I think it's maybe been more localized, uh, maybe in large areas, but not the entire world. I mean, the world is the world economies are shutting down, and um, it, you know, certainly we've never seen anything like this in our lifetime. But if there isn't a call to face our mortality right now, what is it going to take to wake us up? Because um, you know, it's it's serious and. Um, you know, just everything that we hear. I mean, uh, I don't have TV, but the, the news that I do watch uh, through through internet sources, uh, it's it seems like that's all they're talking about. But 
Um, just the way that we're, sequ we're sequestered right now and we're isolated and now's really a time, I think myself, I'm taking, I'm looking at that more seriously. I'm in the, I'm in the, um, the high risk group. Uh, so, you know, the elderly and I've had some health issues in the past, so which make it more risky for me. And so I think for all of us, especially, we don't know. It could you could be a young person, an older person, but it's your point is well taken, Father. And I think it's dangerous to put off conversion. One exactly. of the we've been talking about the Diary of Saint Faustine. One of the pages that really has impressed me most is she has a vision, a real contrast where she sees a group of people that they're eating, they're dancing, improperly dressed, they're living it up, they're partying. It's the party life, the social life. And all of a sudden, they're falling off this cliff into this precipice, and they're lost. Then the other, you can see them climbing up this steep hill, and they're falling, they're getting up, they're bruising themselves, they're cutting themselves, they're suffering, they're carrying a cross. But at the end of the hill, they arrive at this beautiful meadow where there's birds singing, and there's luscious meadows filled, decked with different flowers. They're in heaven, and as soon as they arrive at that, they forget all they suffered. That's a great example of um, being prepared for the day that the Lord will call us. And even though we have to carry, a suffer, carry um, our, our cross, um, I'm working on the lives of the saints now, and today I just uh, did a summary of St. Augustine, and I'm writing down um, Proverbs. One of the Proverbs of St. Augustine I wrote in this little work I'm working on now is, St. Augustine said there was only one man that was born without sin, but there's no man in the world that is without suffering. Wow. Good one. St. Augustine. But there are many men that waste suffering. Mm. Was, is that part of the quote, or is that your... That's my comment. But his quote is this, there's only one man that was born without sin, that's Jesus Christ. Um, but there's, there's no man in this world that has ever lived without suffering. Suffering is part and parcel of the, the human predicament. But it's a question, do we sanctify the suffering or allow the suffering to crush us? It either makes us better or bitter, as I said more than once. Mary, Mary, is there another number maybe we can work on? Or did you have can something I, you I make to one say? comment about yes, that? Yes, you can. I started by saying that um, I was saddened by uh, the lack of catechesis for so many people that really want or hungry, hunger for the truth, all right? But what you just said reminded me of what gives me joy and what gives me hope and what gives me encouragement and what lifts me up. And... It is that Our Lady of Fatima, what she said to the three children, she, and what Jesus told Faustina, Our Lady of Fatima said souls are going, she showed them a vision of hell, and said souls are going to hell because there's no one to pray for them and suffer for them. And Jesus told Faustina, souls are only saved through prayer and suffering. So it reminds me that um, if I can't catechize the whole world, I can pray for the whole world, and I can offer up all my suffering, all my prayers. And something you wrote that I read recently, you said, because I offer my prayers and my suffering, I latched onto that. But you said, and something I read recently, offer everything in your day. Everything in my day, I offer all the good things, the joyful things, the sorrowful things, the things, um, everything in my day. I offer up to God. And it's, and it's a gift, really, of my obedience to his will, trying to do his will through my day. And then everything that he sends me is a gift from him, whether it's suffering or joy, joyful and, or a challenge or, or, or a, a reminder to go to confession because I've sinned. It doesn't matter. If I obey, I offer everything to God and my prayers, and I can pray for every person in the world that that they will be saved. And I've thought about this, Father, and I don't know if you can comment on this, if I can add one more thing, because I would like an answer, is we, we cannot 
um, every person has to turn to God before they die. At some point, they have to say yes to him. All right? But when I, my understanding of it, the way I interpret it is, and I want to know what you think about this, is that my prayers and sufferings, our prayers and sufferings, that are, are everything we offer, our, everything in our life that we offer with our, with our prayers, including our suffering, for souls that we, that we want to be saved and we want all souls saved, is that we earn the graces that will soften hard hearts like dew on the soil, softening the soil, so that when God does give them that one last chance to turn to him, they'll have the, they'll have, their so souls will be softened to say yes. They have to say yes, but it's our prayers, suffering, offering everything we do, our, our giving our will to God, or being obedient to his will, and offering everything, in our, our, including suffering and prayers, for those souls that, that, that gives them, that they, we're earning the graces, and they're flooding their soul with graces that they wouldn't earn on their own, haven't earned on their own, and that that is what will soften the soul, so that they will say yes to God. What do you think about that? Absolutely. Um, tell, uh, three things occurred to me when you were saying that. One would be the example of um, someone I used yesterday, and you know, you probably know the, this person better than me because I haven't actually read her life or her letters. I just have heard talks by Fulton Sheen, and it's Elizabeth Lassier. You said about many years ago, you actually read her letters, and um, she's a servant of God. But her husband, Felix, was converted and became a Catholic Dominican priest, but it was through her suffering she actually became a, a victim soul. And the next would be just the person of Padre Pio. Padre Pio purposely accepted the wounds when he was praying in 1918, uh, the wounds of Christ uh, pierced and penetrated his hands, his feet, and his side. And God said he would suffer that for 50 years. So in 1968, shortly before he died, the stigmata uh, disappeared. Um, what you said, Mary, is so important, but I'd like to, very often what, what's happening in our conversations, you'll say something, I'll build upon it, then Eric will build upon it. It's like we're, we're building a seven-story mountain like Thomas Merton, no? And, um, and I'm, I'm sure both of you will agree with this. Offer your suffering, but let's, it's like a truncated clause where you have another clause that has to finish it. Offer it through the heart of Mary, yeah. but, but I'm not even finished, it's like a double clause. Offer through the heart of Mary on the altar of the cross in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So you give your suffering to Mary, and Mary places that on the cross where Jesus, Mary's underneath the cross, offering Christ to God the Father. But as Fulton Sheen says so eloquently, every time we celebrate a Mass in Tokyo, Bangkok, New York, Chicago, that cross is being transplanted and it's actually being is placed down into the local time and place every time the priest offers the holy sacrifice of the Mass. I feel if we add that to what you said, it's going to be much more powerful. Now, you do not have ministerial priesthood, and you never will. Eric, I mean, technically you could have it, but you probably won't. Uh, ministerial priesthood, you could become a priest, and later vocation, no? Um, but whether or not you're going to I be told you. a ministerial priest, uh, both of you belong to the common priest of the faithful. And that means that you're called, once you're baptized, you're baptized as priest, prophet, and king. What does that mean? As, uh, as king, we're called to serve. A king of service, not of dominion or subjugation. Then a uh, prophet, it doesn't mean looking into the crystal ball, but rather you're announcing and preaching the word of God by word and by example. Then priest, I have ministerial priests to when I was ordained, it's, it's, you have what's called an ontological change. Mm -hmm. I have a, you have two characters within you, baptism and confirmation. I've got three. And that is the indelible mark of baptism, confirmation, 
but also I have one of the priesthood. That gives me certain graces that both of you don't have in that area, no? So, um, you know what, you know what, more and more I'm doing this and I have to keep growing into it. Over the past two years, uh, when I'm making my holy hour in the morning, uh, I, I make it in the morning, it's about an hour and a half now since the coronavirus, which is a blessing because I'm actually extending my holy hour, is um, part of my holy hour is I am preparing for Mass, even though the Mass is going to be two and two and a half hours late later. What I'm doing is I'm placing in Mary's hands these intentions. And among the intentions would be, I pray that all the people that I'll ever minister to, I'm offering reparation for their sins and prevention. So you people right here, you're in our family here. When I say Mass, I'm praying for you and your family members. And I'm praying for Eric and Mary. And I'm praying for all the people that God is going to be placing in my path. Is it going to be a rel relatively small, small or big number? I don't know. That depends upon God, no? But whoever God, guys, I believe an anyone God puts in my path, even though I may not see some of these people, these are people that God has placed in my path so that I would be the means by which they can be saved. Then I'll pray that in the next 24 hours, all those who will die will be given the grace of final repentance. Then I'll pray that many, many souls will be freed from purgatory. Then I pray that all those who will be present in my talks, that they'll receive special graces. Then I'll pray, um, I'll pray in a special way for my family. And my family is this. My blood family, and um, uh, we're nine of us, and my parents have 39 grandchildren, so it's a, it's a pretty big family. Then I'll pray for the Ignatian family. This is a family. Mm -hmm. Then I'll pray for the Oblate family because that's a family. Then I'll pray for the family of St. Peter Chanel. So I, um, more and more as I say Mass and I do my Holy Hour, becoming much more extensive. And um, the, uh, the inspiration I have is that the Lord is saying, you're uh, in a kind of a gentle way, you're still, my, my, my dad had a lot of New York one-liners. Don't be a local yokel. That mean, a local yokel means you're provincial. Don't be so nearsighted. Be Catholic. Kataholos. Universal. Uh, in other words, the sky is the limits. There's so many graces that we can receive. Uh, but I think we limit God's power because of our limit of asking. I said this earlier. I think, um, I think Eric, you should be a Matthew 7-7 seven, seven person. Mary, you should be a Matthew 7-7 seven, seven person. Ask, Ask seek, and you shall receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door shall be open. Whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, the door is open. Why... Why be, as, as Mr. Claudia Broom Jr., why be a local yokel? Mm -hmm. Why be so provincial mm -hmm. in perspective? Why not have a vision that goes above and beyond the mere Hawaiian gardens? Let's go beyond that. I mean, the, the last words of Jesus in the Gospel, what were? He said, go out to the whole world. And Jesus said that until the end of time. Go out to the whole world. The whole world is not baptized yet. The whole world is not Christian. The whole world of Catholics are not saints yet, are they? No. So the the, I think we should. Um, I am both a realist and an idealist. Mm -hmm. I'm a realist because I studied Thomas Aquinas for a few years. Tom, Thomas is a realist. But an idealist is this. We should have high ideals. We should connect ourselves with God. God is infinite. God is eternal. He has no limits. God, I, God, I think, one of the things that Father Greg Staub would often say when he was quoting um, St. Faustina, have bold confidence. Bold confidence. God's giving is limited to our asking. I repeat, God's giving is limited to our asking. 
We're going to ask you for a, uh, you know, a peanut shell, you know, okay. Uh -huh. If we're going to just be asking for the peanut shell, right? Well, I asked for the, the peanut the road, the road shell. Roadhouse, uh, the Roadhouse Inn, right? Yeah. Okay. I asked for the peanut and the shell, but only one, so well, that's not why, why not a billion? Why, 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 why not a billion souls? Is there any comment from the peanut gallery here? <laughs> <laughs> Father, why did you point at me? <laughs> the peanut gallery. I do love, I love peanuts. So I guess that would be true. Uh, yeah, one of the things as you were talking about that is the example that God gave us. Because in the Old Testament, he promised us a Messiah. And we were talking about this earlier today. And I think a lot of people thought that was going to be just a, merely a human being. Mm -hmm. What we received was God himself. God and man. And all the things that Jesus did. You know, you talk about being a realist, but being a realist is understanding the truth about who Jesus is and he has no limitations. There are no limitations and he showed that to us through everything that he did. You look at the miracles and all the amazing things that he gave us and the way that he instituted the Eucharist at the Last Supper. And look at how many people have been fed by the Eucharist from that one meal, which continues, it keeps to multiply, it keeps going. And um, part of, the, I think, in my own mind, we have to really understand the reality of the horizons that we, we have in front of us. And they're a lot further than we as human beings. We, we have a tendency to put things in our own perspective, but God is, he's trying to show us and to wake us up to you know the horizons that he's giving us and father what you're talking about makes a lot of sense and we all need to be doing that as being more universal about and asking for bigger and bigger and bigger things and asking you know with fervor so i think that's a great point father that you bring up mary maybe you can comment upon this i, mean, I don't i never get tired our principle and foundation, but I never get tired of emphasizing tapping into principle and foundation through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And why not? I mean, uh, the world is bad. Uh, we've never had so much proliferation of evil. Even John Paul II speaks about the, um, the structural, uh, ideological, um, structures of evil within the world such as Planned Parenthood and abortion I mean it's not only a, an isolated sin but it's encrusted it's um, institutionalized institutionalized the evil so given that the evil has been institutionalized like deep roots are sinking into the society even contaminating little children now um, I think we have we have to use the most efficacious, powerful means at our disposition, and um, I feel that we're really the three of us are arriving at this in our in our Facebook family. I think we have to tap into the infinite reservoir of the blood of Christ, which saves the whole world, which flows through the mystical body of Christ. Most specific, it flows through the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I think that we're just, I don't know, maybe we're just touching the very um, tip of the iceberg because we're dealing with something infinite. We're finite beings, but I think we have to, we gotta go deeper into this reality. What do you think, Mary? Um, I would agree, and I think that's where Eric was going with that. That's where you went with that, and but you had brought it up first, you know, that, that infinite reservoir. Uh, I loved it that you talked about the Mass because um, what I failed to say earlier is I do unite my, um, 
my sufferings and prayers, but now my whole life, my, my, as an oblation, is my doing the will of God in everything each day. I do offer that for the salvation of souls, the conversion and salvation of souls. But I, I did, I didn't mention, and I do, of course, united to the suffering of Christ on the cross. But you took that a different place. Because where is Christ present on the cross in the world today at the holy sacrifice of the Mass? Mm -hmm. And then you're ta when you're talking about it, it reminded me that, and someone said this, and I believe it's true, that some, every moment of the day, somewhere in the world, Mass is being said. So every moment of the day, Mass is continuously being said and will continue to be said until the end of time. So Mass is like, it's, a, it's, it's one Mass that's continuously being prayed throughout all 24 hours, 365 days a year, until the end of time. And that is what we're tapping into. And it's very, very powerful. And I have to bring in Mary and the Rosary that, um, where would Mary, because the Rosary has become my right, my right hand. It's, it's like atta it, it's attached. It's attached, okay? Because whenever I'm driving or I'm, I just pick it up and I start. I just start praying it, even if I don't only get a decade or two. Um, even if I've done my four rosaries, when I'm going to sleep, I've got it and I'm praying. If I wake up in the middle of the night, I grab it and I'm praying. So um, it's just become attached to me, and so Mary's just right next to me, and Mary takes us to the foot of the cross. And the foot of the cross is the mass. So you're, what you're doing is you're connecting all this for me in my mind and in my heart. When I'm with Mary and I'm praying with Mary, I'm standing with Mary at the foot of the cross at every mass being offered all around the world every moment of every day. And, and that's incredibly powerful and incredibly beautiful. And, we bring, and I can bring all, everything there and leave it there and knowing that Jesus in, will show it to his Father and the Father will capitulate and everything, all the prayers will be answered. No? Beautiful, beautiful. Just piggybacking on what you said, uh, I say the rosary every day at 7.30, and um, what I'm doing is, um, I feel that almost every opportunity I have, I want to be catechizing, and I'm reading the document of John Paul II on the rosary, the Blessed Virgin Mary on the rosary, which came out in the year 2002. Uh, and he... Um, he mentions in number seven and eight, he mentions that we should be praying for world peace and the family. World peace because this is shortly after the attack of the Twin Towers. You know? He said a lot of violence has entered into the new millennium. We have to pray for world peace. Then he says that the family is really being jeopardized, menaced today because of modern ideologies that are violently of, against the family, they're militantly opposed to the, and he mentions the family is the basic building block of society, the basic cell of society. How the family goes is the way the world is going to be going. Then he mentions, um, then he mentions uh, Marian, he says two approved Marian apparitions have been, have been approved by the church in the, um, the last few hundred years. And he mentions two, and it's Fatima and Lourdes. But um, I'd also have to chime in and say Guadalupe, too. It's John Paul II, the place that he visited most in his pontificate was Mexico. He visited there many times. But related to, uh, related to what you said, Mary in the Eucharist. John Paul II says every time the Mass is celebrated, Mary's underneath, Mary's present every Mass. Because Christ is present on the cross. Who is underneath the cross was the Blessed Mother. But when she appeared in, in uh, Mexico, Guadalupe, in 1531, when she appeared in Lourdes in 1858, when she appeared in Fatima in 1917, the the messages were slightly different, but there was a common denominator. 
The message is a little bit different. But the common denominator is every time she appeared, Lourdes, Fatima, and Guadalupe, she asked Juan Diego, she asked Bernadette, she asked the children of Fatima that a church would be built. Why does Mary want the church to be built? Because in the church, you encounter Christ. How? Through his mystical body. How? Through the sacraments. What did uh, Archbishop Gomez say the other day? That we're going to be consecrating this country in Canada to the Blessed Virgin Mary, May 1st, which is the feast day of St. Joseph. But he said uh, there are many titles for Mary. Her Lady of Perpetual Help, Her Lady of Good Counsel. But he wanted to consecrate the world to Mary, or the United States and Canada Mary, on the title of Mary is the Mother of the Church. The thought that occurred to me when I heard about this, Father Craig told me two days ago, is it's really nothing new because at the end of Vatican II, when Lumen Gentium was being composed, they were thinking of having a separate document from Lumen Gentium dedicated to the Blessed Mother, but they decided to place Mary in the context of the most known of all the documents of Vatican II, Lumen Gentium. And what was the title they gave to Mary? Mater Ecclesiae which is English for Mary's and Mother Church. Fulton Sheen said this, when that was proclaimed, the Council Fathers got up, and there was an explosion of applause for minutes, Mary's and Mother of the Church. So what Bishop Gomez is doing is really, he's reiterating what happened, what happened about 55 years ago when the Council Fathers we're proclaiming Mary as the mother of the church. That being said, Eric, what are your thoughts about maybe the role of Mary in um, fostering peace, fostering the family, and fostering catechesis? I do. A big one at you. Do well, you think Mary might have a role in fostering peace, family, and catechesis? This is our topic today, isn't it? Yes. It is. The answer is that she has an essential role, not because we made it up or that we uh, are, um, you know, we would like it to be so. It's because it is the way that God ordained it from the from the very beginning, and it the importance of us in our, we're talking about different levels of offering and in like really big, really important intentions. I believe it's essential for us to be offering everything up uh, every day um, and do a, a formal morning offering every day through Mary. And all of these intentions, I, I believe, uh, I, I believe that God wants and expects us to, to be doing that. I really do believe that that's the way he has, has set it up. I agree. So you're saying that offering up everything. So, as St. Paul says, whether you eat or drink, do everything for the honor and glory of God. In your morning offer, that means that you can be offering up even maybe taking a walk or going kayaking or maybe yeah. um, even the most mundane, simple activities that seem to be almost insignificant. You can offer up even those. It doesn't have to be something monolithic. It does not. It is all, it's everything, Father. <laughs> that sounds like a big statue. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a big, a big, scary statue, but I'm not afraid of it because I've got my blessed mother. I've got my blessed mother to protect me. But yes, the, uh, you know, I mean, we've all of us in this this room, and I would say probably most of the people that are in our audience have done a formal consecration, and whether we remember that or not, 
we've already done exactly what you just said, Father. We've offered everything that we've ever had, everything that we have and everything that we ever will have and do uh, to Jesus through Mary. You know, Eric and Mary, I do this implicitly before any of the talks I give, and both of you have been with me for quite a few years now. Uh, can you ever remember me ever giving a talk in which I have not started with a Hail Mary and a prayer to the Holy Spirit? Mm, I don't remember at all, anything, well, always. I mean, I just like we started today and by praying the Hail Mary, then we prayed the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of an implicit, indirect way in which I'm saying, Mary, uh, this is yours. And once you do that, I'm just at peace because if, uh, if it's placed in Mary's hands, there was a famous theologian, Favre, mm -hmm. who said that where there is little success, there's little Mary. So if we want to have spiritual success, I'm not going to say economic success, we want to have spiritual success to please God and to save souls, we place it in Mary's hands do you remember, Eric, the example of St. Louis de Montfort with the apple? Yes. Can you tell us that? Well, it's, there's a, a poor man that uh, wanted to make an offering to the king, but all he had was an apple. And the only apple he had had a few little flaws in it. Maybe there was a worm in it. But the pauper uh, was... He was smart. He was using his intellect that if he's going to present it to the king, he wanted someone to help him prepare. And who better to prepare the apple and to put, put to order the apple, if you will, would be the queen. And so the pauper gives the apple to the queen. She dices it up and prepares a beautiful uh, preparation she gets rid of the worm and all of the the little spots the the little imperfections of the apple and she puts a beautiful garnish around it on a gold plate and she presents it to the king and the king thinks that's the best apple I've ever had how do you, inter how do you interpret that though with respect to our consecration to Jesus through Mary the, the way that I interpret it is that why not give everything to the queen and let her perfect it before she gives it to Christ the King. Who is that queen? Our Blessed Mother. You got it. The queen of the universe. That's why the expression we hear, all through Mary. All through Mary. She's the queen of the angels, queen of the saints, queen of martyrs, queen of the Holy Rosary. And as St. Louis de Montfort says, she's the queen of all hearts. It's a beautiful way to end our program today. And in about a minute or two, we're going to be praying the chapel of Divine Mercy. So I'd like to give you my priestly blessing. And uh, uh, don't move because we'll be praying the chaplet. It's going to be the mercy hour on, on Friday. You're in, the, you're in the best place. So I'll give you my priestly blessing. We'll be starting our prayer in a couple of minutes. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.